I just love that we have a guy section and a girl section for whatever reason, besides like three people on each side. Tedros, even during grade wars, would not sit with the guys. There's no way he's going to on a random Sunday. Well, hey guys, welcome to youth. My name is Jeremiah. Your name is. I heard Mallory the loudest saying a correct thing. Jaquan yelled my name the loudest. So um, I have a question for you guys. As we're heading into 2023, we're now a couple weeks in. What is something like a milestone for this year that you're really looking forward to? So like, are you maybe graduating this year? Turning 18. No, it's turning 18. That's a big one. Uh, getting your driver's license. Are any of you going to actually do that? Are you getting your permit this year? A couple of you. I will never get, like, there is a, the first generation gap that I feel as a youth pastor. Like, I immediately got my permit and my license as soon as I could. And some of you guys are like, ah, I'm going to be 42 and still have my parents drive me everywhere. I have no desire to get that. A lot. You need to have your own license. <laughs> so one of the things for this year for me personally that I'm most excited for, unfortunately, I have a sick toddler, so my wife is not here. But if you know my wife, her name is Ellie. She's great. Love her very much. This summer, we celebrate 10 years of being married together. So I'm very, very excited for that. Um, yeah, you can clap that. Let's clap for it. We've been together 12 years in August. And here's what I learned about her 12 years ago. So my wife will always love one thing more than she will ever love me more than she loves our dog, our kids, her minivan that she's obsessed with. There's one thing, no matter how bad her day is, no matter where she's at, that she wants the moment she comes in the door, and that is an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. She yeah. loves Dr. Pepper. <laughs> so does Mallory. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, Jesus, me is probably the order. Whenever we were stuck at home, like for COVID, and they were like, find whatever you have in your house to take communion with. It was Dr. Pepper every time in our house. She loves Dr. Pepper, um, which some people I found here like really hate Dr. Pepper, yeah, it's but so it's such a weird thing to me. In the South, it's, it's huge. So she loves Dr. Pepper and she loves Mexican food. And so what, yes. So our date nights are almost always going to get Mexican food. And so she will walk in. She'll be doing like a little happy dance because she's about to get cheese dip. And as always, the waiter walks up and says, what would you like to drink? And she always says a Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. And nothing makes her sadder than when they say, well, will a Mr. Pib be okay? Yeah. She just instantly gets sad because the answer is no, it's not okay. You shouldn't serve that to people. But... She always says, yes, that's fine. You see, something that um, I've learned, and I'm sure all you guys can agree with, is sometimes like the name brand is the thing that you want. Like a Dr. Pepper versus a Mr. Pib. If you're like a Pepsi versus a Coke person, like you have the one that you want. So I started asking around the office this week, asking people like, hey, what is a name brand thing that you only want the name brand of? 
is Tyler in here yet? No, he's still not in here yet. But Tyler's thing that he instantly said was, I want name brand Pop-Tarts, not toaster pastries. Like, I can understand that. Good old Bondo said, I want name brand toilet paper. Do not buy great value toilet paper. Um, some other ones that got thrown out was cereal. Like, I don't want fruit grams. I want fruit loops. Doritos, Kleenex, all sorts of different ones where people are like, I want the name brand. For me personally, it's ranch. I want Hidden Valley Ranch. I don't want your Walmart brand name ranch. Buy the real ranch. It's my rant for the day. So um, another thing that got thrown out in this process was somebody said coffee. And um, actually, when it comes to coffee, I'm surprised at how often you can buy off-brand name coffee and people don't get it. And again, we're going to pick on Tyler since he's not in here. Tyler has this thing about Starbucks. He hates Starbucks. Doesn't like their coffee, doesn't like their grounds, doesn't like their K-cups. Do you guys hate Starbucks? Yes. Some of you yes, some of you no. I don't like I like the sandwiches. You like the sandwiches. All right. I do not dislike Starbucks. I like Starbucks a lot. And um, so what I would do when Tyler first joined the youth team was I would get him Starbucks coffee all the time and then lie about it being Starbucks coffee just to see what he would do. So sometimes I would get the grounds, I'd make like pour over coffee and he'd try to be like, oh, that's so great. I love those beans. It has hints of them. Like it's from Starbucks. And then he would get really mad. Or I would go make K-cup coffee, which is not real coffee, if you ask him, and it would be Starbucks. But I would say, hey, I made this, just to see what he would do. And he couldn't quite tell it apart. And there are some things like that where it doesn't matter if it's a name brand, doesn't matter if it's an off brand, it's kind of hard to tell the original from the fake. Another example of this that I saw this week, I was scrolling through um, TikTok, was like, is it cake? or not. Have you guys ever seen those videos? These ones are some pretty easy ones, but I thought if you've never seen them, this will give you an example of it. So like, is this cake or is this a turtle? That one's cake, right? Now, the, some of these are a little bit harder. Is that a coconut or is that cake? That one is real. I think we have just a couple more. That's cake, but that does make me want a Popeye's chicken sandwich. Ew. Cake? Yes, no, those are actually real. Yeah. That one's cake. The bowl is warped, yeah. So th sometimes it's hard to tell the real thing from a fake, and sometimes it's super easy to tell if something is the real deal or if it's fake. And you guys have probably already experienced this in life, and if you've not yet, I guarantee you, you will. As you go throughout life, you'll begin to see that this applies to people. That there are sometimes when you meet somebody and you don't know whether they are truly like a person who's going to be a great friend or if they're not. They're kind of just faking it. Maybe it is um, a guy or a girl that you've met and um, you're thinking, oh, like they would be a great person to date. And then the more you get to know them, the more you get to see just how kind of messed up and jacked up they are. Or maybe it's just a friend that you thought you could share a secret with, that you thought you could kind of let into your circle, and then they turn around and they end up telling that to everyone. And you find out very quickly that is a fake person. Well, outside of just friendships and relationships, this ends up applying to us, excuse me, and our spiritual life. As you begin to get into church more and more, and you begin to invest in people more and more, you'll learn that not everybody is as spiritual as maybe they paint themselves out to be. Maybe they do come to small group every week. They do sometimes share the right thing. They know how to use scripture, but like inside, they're just kind of rotten and they're pretending. And maybe you see those little moments like the school them versus the church them, and they're two totally different people. 
If I'm honest with you guys, that is actually a huge part of my story. When I was about 12 years old is when my parents adopted me and I went to go live with them and we lived in Nashville, which meant I had to learn how to play guitar. And so <laughs> I started playing guitar, I loved it. And um, I had to then start playing at church because they were heavily involved in church. I didn't believe in Jesus, I didn't believe in the songs that I sang, but I did believe in playing guitar in front of a lot of people. And so I was committed to doing it. And I began to learn the, the, the lingo, learn when to raise your hands and when to nod and when to just say the right thing. And I began to learn scripture. And it's not because I cared about what it had to say, but it was because in small group settings, I wanted to be able to throw out the right thing to look spiritual for all of the church girls. I'm talking to this side because I was the guy and all the girls are over here. But like I wanted the girls to know that I knew what the Bible said, and I was that guy, and then <laughs> I'm like that too. There you go. Um, and so I even started helping lead like a middle school small group by the time I was in high school. Whenever I was 15, the church offered to pay me. I became a paid worship leader on staff, and while I was doing all of this, I didn't know who Jesus was. And it's one thing to, like, joke about it now that that has changed. But back then, that's something that should have never happened. But I was faking my faith, and I was getting by with it. No one questioned it. And today, we're going to look at a passage in Scripture where Jesus tells his disciples that this is going to happen. There are going to be fake followers of me everywhere. And you need to be on guard and you need to know this kind of core lesson that he gets at. It's from the book of Matthew. Everybody say Matthew. Matthew. And it's in chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles or your phones and you want to follow along, we're going to be in Matthew. chapter 13. Very good. So Matthew is one of four very special books in your Bible. There are four Gospels. Very good job. Now, in those Gospels, um, this one that's written by this guy named Matthew, a Gospel just means it's a collection of the stories about Jesus. And now, in a lot of the stories that Jesus told, he told these things called parables. Everybody say parables. A parable is a story with a secret meaning that's not a literal story. Does that make sense? The middle schoolers were very confused by that. Some of you are nodding yes. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm still a middle schooler. Uh, <laughs> as we tell this story, you'll begin to see what I mean. So Jesus gets his disciples together and he starts telling them this parable. This comes from Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 24. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed a good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the weed that went, came, so, uh, sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Now, how many of you were like raised on a farm? Okay, just about nobody. There's one person in the back. How many of you are in like 4-H? Very few of you. So I'm going to assume most people don't know what this means before I butchered it. But <laughs> even past that. So here's the breakdown of what Jesus is saying. There is a man with a field. We all get that concept, right? And he goes out and he plants a bunch of good seeds that's supposed to bring up Wheat. Now, what do you use wheat to make? Bread. Bread, gluten, all that type of stuff, right? Anything that's delicious, wheat is probably in. Now, as he ha has done this, he's planted all of his seeds. An enemy comes and he starts planting something that's going to raise up a weed. Now, I grew up in the South, and in the South, they use the King James Version of the Bible a lot, which is like a really old school version. And it actually uses a better word than weed. It uses the word tear. Everybody say tear. tear. Tear is a specific type of plant. And I have a picture of what wheat looks like next to a tear. Maybe. There we go. 
So on this side, this is wheat before it's fully ripe, and this is a tear before it's fully ripe, and they look very similar. And so with that in mind, here's this next section of Scripture, starting in verse 27. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did all of these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Now, again, there's kind of two reasons why he's saying, I don't want you to go and start weeding this field of wheat. And the first, if we pull up that picture again, is you can't really tell a difference while it's growing between the wheat and the tares, right? They look identical. They're both green. They both have a stalk on them. They're both going to be about the same height. It's not going to work. And another reason is if you've ever planted a garden and you go in and you start ripping stuff up while everything is still just budding and just starting, you're going to uproot the good plant. And so this guy's saying, hey, just leave it alone, let it rest, and eventually a harvest time will come. And here's how this passage ends. Verse 30, he says, let both grow together until the harvest At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, at harvest time, you can tell wheat and tares apart in an instant. Now, here's a picture of what they both look like at harvest time. And you can see the grain grows different. On wheat, it's straight. On tares, it's kind of zigzagged. But the other thing, which is kind of hard to put in a picture for you guys, if you've ever seen a field of wheat at harvest time, it grows up and then it starts to lay over like this because it's a really skinny stalk with this grain at the top. Tares, on the other hand, stand straight up. So even though they're the same height, you could walk out there and easily tell everything that's standing straight up, just go through, cut it off, bundle it together, throw it in a fire. And then everything that's laid over, that's going to be the good wheat. We're going to take that and we're going to store that. Now, do you guys think Jesus gathered his disciples together and just like, hey, let me give you guys some advice on farming. No, right? That's what a parable is. He's telling them a story, but underneath it, there's a hidden meaning that he's trying to get them to understand. And whenever we look at this parable with his meaning, we can begin to make sense of what he's talking about. First, there's the man with the field. That person is Jesus, right? And he's going through and he's planting all of these good seeds. The reality is these plants, that's us. And as he's going through and he's planting them, there's, he only plants these good seeds. And then an enemy, that's Satan, the devil, the deceiver, whatever you want to call him, he comes in and it's really important to note, he can't uproot the good plants, so he plants bad plants. He plants things to deceive us, to throw us off. And then Jesus talks about a time of harvest, and that is judgment day, Armageddon, whatever fancy word you want to call it. But Scripture tells us there's going to be a day that Jesus looks at each and every one of us and says, hey, you didn't really know me, and you're going to go somewhere not very fun, right? The tares didn't go have a party. And then he takes everyone who does, and that's the reality of heaven versus the reality of of hell. And whenever we look at this parable through that lens, there's kind of three key things that I want us to all understand. The first thing is whenever all these plants are just budding, they're growing, that's our life. During this phase, Jesus says it's not your job to go through and try to weed. It's not your job to try to figure out who's who. It's not our job to go around and judge people. During this phase, it's just our job to love people. There's not another way around it. Jesus says, it's my job to judge people's heart, and I'm going to wait until the day of harvest to do that. The second really important thing to know, and this should be a really good thing for you if you're someone who has made a commitment to follow Jesus, you've been baptized, you said, God, I'm all in, and that's that Satan can't steal you from God. 
In the story, Satan can't come in and he doesn't uproot people. He will deceive you. He will lie to you. He will do everything he can to derail your life. But he can't take your salvation from you. And the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul words it this way. He says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears of today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is something that everyone in here should be really excited about. Satan can't steal you from God. He can't steal your salvation, but he can make you want to leave. He can tempt you enough that you walk away from God. And that's a scary reality to be in, which is what brings us to our third thing we got to learn from this parable, and that's that we need to take a hard look in the mirror. No one here knows your heart but you. No one here knows if you're faking this or if you're genuine. Only you know that. Only you can tell us where God's at in your life, where God's at in your heart. And you can be someone who's like me and you can fake doing church for a really long time, But I had a moment when I was 16, standing on stage in front of 2,000 teenagers leading worship, and they're over here baptizing kids like crazy, and I'm over here singing lyrics. I'm like, God, I don't know what this means. I know when to say the right words. I know when to tell people to raise their hands, but God, I don't know you. And so it was this mixture of a moment of like both shame of admitting my lie in front of everyone, but joy when I laid down my guitar and basically jumped in the baptistry and said, I need to be baptized and I need to follow Jesus. In that moment, I switched from being a tear or a weed to being wheat to being who God intended me to be. And for some of you, you have been pretending to do church for so long But when you look at your life, you know you are absolutely no different than any of your friends who don't know Jesus. And maybe you have a couple of little boundaries that you're like, I'll never cross this because if I do, I know there's no coming back, right? Like I'm not sleeping with my boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm doing everything else that I can. But since I'm not doing that, I'm okay and I'm a Christian. It's not how it works. Or maybe for you, it's the way that you cope whenever you're alone whether that's a website that you choose to go to, maybe it's something you choose to do to your own body, maybe it's thoughts that you choose to wrestle with and not tell anybody. All of those are different versions of self-harm, and Jesus has been screaming, I'm here to give you freedom, but instead we choose to live in our own prisons. No one knows what you're wrestling with in your heart except for you. And the reality is, is that we serve a God who looked at you and said, you're worth dying for. Will you just believe and follow me? Will you just give me every burden that you have and follow me? Everything you've done, everything that's been done to you, I can work with. You just have to choose to follow me. Give up chasing nothing and start running to the Father and following Jesus. Maybe for some of you, you have done church for a while and uh, you do know the right things to say and you said a prayer once at a camp and then somebody talked about baptism. You're like, that kind of freaks me out. Why is there this water tank? Why do I got to do this in front of people? I'm just going to press the brakes on that. Listen, when we look at the Bible, every time someone chooses to follow Jesus, they believe and then they are baptized. Jesus said, this is your public Uh, pronunciation of your faith. This is the moment where you tell everybody I'm all in and some of you have been standing at the ledge and you're not ready to take that step yet and Jesus is saying, just trust me. 
And then for some of you, you, you know, you've done all of those things. You're like, Jeremiah, I've checked every box. I know I know who Jesus is. I know I know right from wrong. But I've been choosing wrong a lot. What do I do next? Luckily, Jesus knew everything you would do, past, present, and future. And he said, you're still worth it. And there's this lovely thing called grace that's going to cover you for your life. You just have to choose to come home. You just have to choose to say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm sorry, and I want to chase after you. I can tell just by the look on some of your faces that some of you are are getting this, and you're realizing that you're not where you want to be spiritually. We're going to just take a a few minutes and sing a worship song together. And during that song, I'm going to challenge you to take a step of faith and go talk to a leader. They're all across this room. They're not here to judge you. They're just here to love you and show you who Jesus is. The song that we're going to sing is Run to the Father. It's one of my favorites, and I love it because no matter where you're at in your relationship with Jesus, your next step is to run to the Father. Some of you need to do that for the first time and ask for forgiveness and believe in Jesus for the first time. Some of you need to run to the Father and say, I'm going to take this step of obedience and be baptized. And some of you need to run to the Father and just say, God, I'm sorry. My favorite line in this song is the start of the chorus. I run to the Father and I fall into grace. He understands where you're at. He doesn't hate you or dislike you because of it. He's just asking for you to come home. Let's pray. Father, we come.